everybody, and welcome to There and Back Again. I'm Alistair Stevens. Tonight, in the 63rd part of our exploration of Tolkien's Middle-earth, we approach the end of the fifth book of The Lord of the Rings with the conclusion of Chapter 8, and then a valiant effort to make it through Chapter 9, The Last Debate, and Chapter 10, The Black Gate, opens a counterpoint to the third chapter of Book 4 of The Lord of the Rings, The Black Gate is Closed, How Things Have Changed Here in Middle-earth. Now. I'm going to be honest right up front, I have a full 20 slides pulled for tonight's session, and that is an unconquerable challenge, I think. 12 slides is, that's a, that's a good night's work. 14, well, okay, there's an outside possibility, but it's very unlikely that we are going to cover 20 full slides, particularly because these slides are so rich. There's just so much to discuss. However, I have received a couple of emails in the last week, including emails from listeners Will and Caitlin concerning the elves and the dwarves in The War of the Ring. Their questions are, I suppose, best summed up by, hey, what about the elves and the dwarves in The War of the Ring? What's with them? What? what and why? And where are they, in fact? And there is a rich story happening elsewhere in Middle-earth, and we're going to dive into that probably a little bit next week. So we're going to do our best to clear Chapter 9 tonight, then spend some time next week covering Chapter 10 and discussing some more related issues, including Black Numenorians like the Mouth of Sauron, and uh, what exactly is keeping Thranduil and Dian and other, th other key characters from helping Gondor out in its hour of need. We begin this week's discussion, though, back in the Houses of Healing. Burgil has brought the Athalas to Aragorn. He has breathed on it in his kingly fashion. He has exercised his regal authority in the healing of Faramir. And now we turn our attention to Eowyn, who, minor spoilers, is not actually going to complete her arc in the span of this one chapter. We're going to have to hold on just a little longer to see where Eowyn ends up, but this is rich and wonderful and beautiful stuff. So let's begin with Chapter 8, The Houses of the Healing, and Aragorn finally, finally getting around to Eowyn. But Aragorn came to Eowyn, and he said, Here there is a grievous hurt and a heavy blow. The arm that was broken has been tended with due skill, and it will mend in time if she has the strength to live. It is the shield arm that is maimed, but the chief evil comes through the sword arm. In that there now seems no life, although it is unbroken. Alas, for she was pitted against a foe beyond the strength of her mind or body, and those who will take a weapon to such an enemy must be sterner than steel if the very shock shall not destroy them. It was an evil doom that set her in his path, for she is a fair maiden, fairest lady of a house of queens, and yet I know not how I should speak of her. When I first looked on her and perceived her unhappiness, it seemed to me that I saw a white flower standing straight and proud, shapely as a lily, and yet knew that it was hard, as if wrought by elf rites out of steel." Or was it, maybe, a frost that had turned its sap to ice, and so it stood, bitter sweet, still fair to see, but stricken, soon to fall and die? Her malady begins far back before this day, does it not, Aomer? I marvel that you should ask me, Lord, he answered, for I hold you blameless in this matter, as in all else. Yet I knew not that Eowyn, my sister, was touched by any frost until she first looked on you. Care and dread she had, and shared with me in the days of worm tongue and the king's bewitchment, and she tended the king in growing fear. But that did not, uh, excuse me, but that did not bring her to this pass. My friend, said Gandalf, you had horses and deeds of arms and the free fields, but she, born in the body of a maid, had a spirit and courage at least the match of yours. Yet she was doomed to wait upon an old man whom she loved as a father, and watching him falling into a mean dishonored dotage, and her part seemed to be more ignoble than that of the staff he leaned on. Think you that Wormtongue had poisoned only Theoden's ears? Dotard, what is the house of Aeol but a thatched barn where brigands drink in the reek and their brats roll on the floor among their dogs? Have you not heard those words before? Saruman spoke them, the teacher of Wormtongue, though I do not doubt that Wormtongue at home wrapped their meaning in terms more cunning. My lord, if your sister's love for you and her will still bent to her duty had not restrained her lips, you might have heard even such things as these escape them. But who knows what she spoke to the darkness, alone, in the bitter watches of the night, when all her life seemed shrinking, and the walls of her bower closing in about her, her hutch to trammel some wild thing in. So this is the tragedy of Eowyn, the imperfect and incomplete tragedy of Eowyn, but the tragedy of Eowyn nonetheless. So Aragorn goes to her and studies her and sees the wounds inflicted upon her arms, in effect, that her shield arm is broken, that it has been maimed, but it has also been healed because it was a conventional assault, if you will. It's just a broken arm and it's probably going to be okay if she still carries within her the will to live. But through the sword arm, the darkness has entered her in exactly the same way as it has entered Mary too. You cannot strike at the Witch King of Angmar and suffer no consequence. 
But that is not the entirety of the malady facing Eowyn here. We're talking about Eowyn's desire for life, about her desire to make it through this and to endure and to overcome and to be restored to full health. Aragorn observes this the first time that he met her. It was an evil doom that sent her in, her in his path, for she is a fair maiden, fairest lady of a house of queens, and yet I know not how I should speak of her. When I first looked on her and perceived her unhappiness, it seemed to me that I saw a white flower standing straight and proud, shapely as a lily, and yet knew that it was hard as if wrought by elf rites out of steel or ice. The first time that he saw her, he perceived her unhappiness. He's not... <laughs> He's not just talking about her love for him. He's talking in part about her love for him because he seems to be inferring reciprocally here that part of Eowyn's attraction to Aragorn was this warrior heart that beat within her breast, this, this desire for greatness and for glory, the spirit and courage, at least the match of yours, as Gandalf says to Eomer. But Eomer rejects that outright. I marvel that you should ask me, Lord, for I hold you blameless in this matter, as in all else. Yeah, Aragorn, this is not actually, like, your fault. This is not this is not lovesickness that is causing Eowyn to pine away here. This is not what is happening. It is not for the love of you that she is laying here and, and resisting the urge to return to life or failing to fight to return to life. It's not you, Aragorn. I knew not that Eowyn, my sister, was touched by any frost until she first looked on you. That was the moment that I realized, yes, but I don't think that that is it. Care and dread she had and shared with me in the days of Wormtongue and the king's bewitchment. She tended the king in growing fear, but that did not bring her to this pass. It wasn't you, and it wasn't Wormtongue. It was something else. And Gandalf leans in. He interposes himself at this point. You... Eomer, you had horses and deed of arms and the free fields, but she, born in the body of a maid, had a spirit and courage at least the match of yours. You two are just the same. You are just the same. But you got to rove around Rohan. You got to live the life of a warrior of the Rohirrim, and she did not. She was doomed to wait upon an old man whom she loved as a father and watch him fall into a mean dishonored dotage, and her part seemed to her more ignoble than that of the staff he leaned on. Let's be very careful about our analysis here, too. Gandalf is not saying you're a man and got to ride around and have fun in the great outdoors. Eowyn is a woman, so she had to stay home and take care of things. It's not the woman's role here that seems to be responsible for Eowyn's ice, for her steel, for whatever it is that afflicts her, or at least it's not merely the role of a woman of the Rohirrim that, that causes Eowyn to feel this way. It's being with Theoden under the influence of Wormtongue. Think you that Wormtongue had poison only for Theoden's ears? And then he quotes Saruman's passage from Orthanc here. Dotard, what is the house of Eorl but a thatched barn where brigands drink in the reek and their brats roll on the floor among the dogs? Have you not heard those words before? Saruman spoke them, the teacher of Wormtongue, though I have no doubt that Wormtongue at home wrapped their meaning in terms more cunning? There's no way that Wormtongue didn't have an influence over Eowyn, not because she is a woman, but because she was at Methazel, because she was in Edoras with Theoden. She was fated to watch Theoden fall under the sway of Wormtongue, to lose his faculties, to lose his life, to lose his essence, to all but lose his identity completely under the under the, the last spell of, of Wormtongue here, but also she was susceptible to that as well. It's unlikely that Wormtongue was as abrupt, was as caustic as Saruman is, but he certainly held the same casual contempt for the Rohirrim. And Eowyn would have picked that up. My lord, if your sister's love for you and her will to stay bent to her duty had not restrained her lips, you might have heard you might have heard even such things as these escape them. She definitely heard this stuff and internalized it and saw the tension and the iniquity, the conflict within her of the fallen realm of Rohan, in effect, right, under Worm, uh, Wormtongue's influence. Yeah, I almost said Wormtail, which would have brought us into a different fantasy realm. Uh, under Wormtongue's influence, she saw the tension between the fallen kingdom of Rohan and the decrepit figure of Theoden King and her own warrior's heart, her own courage and spirit. There is a push-pull tension there that as I say, is one of the things that isn't going to be resolved. Just stick around for uh, chapter five of book six, you guys, The Steward and the King. We're going to have plenty of opportunity to talk more about Eowyn when we get there. So Eowyn is possessed of a great heart and an unfortunate fate. That seems to be what has brought us to this impasse. That seems to be 
by implication, what led her to the devilry and the madness that carried her to the Pelennor field in the first place. That this tension between Wormtongue's perspective on Rohan and the, the fell and malign influence by proxy of Saruman over Methazald and over Theoden King specifically, that this warred within her with her warrior's heart and led her to make more rash choices than she otherwise might. Was Eowyn truly in love with Aragorn? Is Eowyn truly in love with Aragorn? Or is that a desire for greatness? Is she recognizing something great and pure that is held in abeyance, not just within the kingdom of Rohan, not just within the figure of her adoptive father, Theoden King, but also within her own heart? Well, your mileage may vary. It all depends on your personal interpretation of the story, whether or not Eowyn was truly in love with Aragorn or whether he simply represented something that was ignobly absent from her life at this point. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm screaming, quoting, you can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. Um, the Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings from Futurama, I believe. A very, very good episode. Okay, let's uh, let's keep pushing on here then into the waking of Eowyn. We have a few more slides to, to talk about here in the Houses of Healing. I have maybe the power to heal her body and to recall her from the Dark Valley. But to what she will awake, hope or forgetfulness or despair, I do not know. And if to despair, then she will die. Unless other healing comes, which I cannot bring, alas, for her deeds have set her among the queens of great renown. Then Aragorn stooped and looked in her face, and it was indeed white as a lily, cold as frost and hard as graven stone. But he bent and kissed her on the brow and called her softly, saying, Eowyn, Eowyn's daughter, awake, for your enemy has passed away. She did not stir, but now she began again to breathe deeply, so that her breast rose and fell beneath the white linen of the sheet. Once more Aragorn bruised two leaves of Athelas and cast them into steaming water, and he laved her brow with it and her right arm lying cold and nerveless on the coverlet. Then, whether Aragorn had indeed some forgotten power of Westerness, or whether it was but his words of the Lady Eowyn that wrought on them, as the sweet influence of the herb stole about the chamber, it seemed to those who stood by that a keen wind blew through the window, and it bore no scent, but was an air wholly fresh and clean and young, as if it had not before been breathed by any living thing, and came new made from snowy mountains high beneath a dome of stars, or from shores of silver far away, washed by seas of foam. Awake! Eowyn, Lady of Rohan, said Aragorn again, and he took her right hand in his and felt it warm with life returning. Awake, the shadow is gone, and all darkness is washed clean. Then he laid her hand in Eomer's and stepped away. Call her, he said, and he passed silently from the chamber. Eowyn, Eowyn, cried Eomer amid his tears. But she opened her eyes and said, Eomer, what joy is this, for they said that you were slain. Nay, but that was only the dark voices in my dream. How long have I been dreaming? Not long, my sister, said Eomer, but think no more on it. Whether Aragorn had indeed some forgotten power of Western ass, or whether it was but his words of the Lady Eowyn that wrought on them. Aragorn has some forgotten power of Western ass, you guys. And the power of Western ass that we see embodied in Aragorn here is not some innate magical power. It's not that the men of Western S are, are sorcerers and have this innate healing ability. It's something more complicated than that, as we've discussed previously. Aragorn is the king, and the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. Here, wielding the Athalas again, casting it once more into the water, bruising the leaves and casting them into the water, and this new clear air coming in, driving out the dark breath of the Nazgul, right? Driving out their, their dark influence here. I do want to kind of hit a couple of these points. I want to talk about how Aragorn refers to Eowyn in this passage, I suppose. Alas, for her deeds have set her among the queens of great renown. This is carrying on from the acknowledgement in the previous slide, I suppose, an absolute acknowledgement that, that Eowyn is not queen, right? Eowyn is probably never going to be queen because of the fact that she is the king's sister. It's, it's very unlikely in Rohan that she's going to end up the queen, right? But she is still a queen. That, in case you were wondering, is why it's a lowercase Q instead of a capital Q there, right? She's not actually a queen. We're using queens metaphorically here. We're using them representatively here to speak to well, this is in the context of Aragorn in the Houses of Healing. So what do we mean when we're making reference here to uh, a noble lineage of rule? What do we mean when we're, we're attributing to Eowyn the qualities of queenship, the qualities of, of effectively kingliness and regality? 
well, we're describing her not uniquity, I suppose, absolutely in the scale of Middle Earth, but her singular uniquity. She is a woman unlike most other women. She is a woman apart from her role in Rohan. She is something else. She is a queen, even if she isn't actually a capital Q queen, right? Eowyn, Eowyn's daughter, awake, for your enemy has passed away. The battle has been fought. You have been victorious, right? Note here, he doesn't say, the battle is won and the enemy has been routed and everything's okay. He doesn't say that. For your enemy has passed away. Eowyn, Eowyn's daughter, representing this, this lineage of warriordom, I suppose, this, this heritage, this inheritance of courage and of spirit that we described earlier. You are your father's daughter and you have slain your enemy. There is no time now for sleep. You must not be lost in the shadow. You must not be lost in this dark valley though you may awake to hope or forgetfulness or despair. Aragorn kind of pinning the bounds of the spectrum here. Well, yeah, she might wake up with hope, which would be great. She might wake up with forgetfulness, which would be, well, uh, kind of a wash. Or she might wake up in despair. That would be really bad, actually, because if she wakes up in despair, then she will die unless other healing comes, which I cannot bring. And have I mentioned that I'm the returning king? So I'm bringing the best healing. I'm bringing those, those good, good band-aids. I'm bringing, like, the best healing that you can get. So Eowyn, Eowyn's daughter, awake for your enemy has passed away. And we start to, we see him, um, was it, uh, who was it in the chat earlier who was um, talking about wiping her down in the extended cut of the, um, of the Return of the King movie? That's kind of, I mean, it's not not that. I, I, I see what we're doing here, right? So he uh, he wipes her down. He he kind of gives her this, uh, this bomb of the Athelos here. He... Uh, um, kisses her on the brow and calls her softly, right? So before he says Eowyn, Eowyn's daughter, he kisses her on the brow, which is the most kingly act. That is it. If you are looking for like purest condescension from a king to anyone else, that is it. The kissing on the brow is the most powerful symbol of that condescension. That is incredibly, not romantically intimate, but incredibly regally intimate, I suppose. That is the, the ultimate expression of a kingly relationship with someone of a lower order. Or I guess, actually, actually, the penultimate. It's it's the 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 second greatest expression of that, that kingly regard. We are going to see the greatest expression of that kingly regard later, when Aragorn and Frodo meet again. Um, so then we get our passage on the forgotten power of Western S. We see that she is starting to breathe again. We're starting to, you know, inhabit here. Um, I will note that um, she did not stir, but now she began again to breathe deeply so that her breast rose and fell beneath the white linen of the sheet. There is nothing salacious in the use of the word breast there. There is nothing sexual or even gendered in the use of the word breast there. Tolkien is clearly using it in its Middle English form, just meaning chest. It is, it is not at all, you know, a, a little moment of titillation for the reader there about uh, about Eowyn. So just to clarify that point pretty pretty uh, comprehensively there. So the wind blows and Aragorn speaks again. Awake, Eowyn, Lady of Rohan, not just your father's daughter, but a lady in your own right. Not a queen. That would be disingenuous to refer to her as Queen of Rohan, but Eowyn, Lady of Rohan, woman in your own right. Awake, the shadow is gone and all darkness is washed clean. He's not clearly talking about Sauron. He's not clearly talking about the war. He's not even talking about the darkness that flowed forth from Mordor and, and was accounted for in the Dawnless Day, right? That's not what he's talking about because that's clearly untrue. Sauron's actually a really significant issue that we're going to have to deal with in the next couple of chapters, it turns out. So this is not awake, Eowyn, we have saved the day and everything is great from now on and now we're going to have eight chapters of Denouement and everyone's going to go home and it's all going to be awesome. And have you met Faramir? Have you met Faramir, Eowyn? I think you're really going to like it. No, we're not doing that. The shadow is gone and all darkness is washed clean. This is the shadow on her heart. This is the the stain of the influence of the Nazgul here. This is the, the darkness to which he is referring. It's not a general darkness, but it's a very specific darkness. The wind comes in and the darkness is washed clean. Then he laid her hand in Aomer's and stepped away. Call her, he said, and he passed silently from the chamber. Why does Aragorn pass silently from the chamber? Why does Aragorn leave Eowyn's side when she is clearly on the brink of waking? Why is he failing to demonstrate that direct kingly authority that he just demonstrated with Faramir, right? Remember when he rouses Faramir from his slumber and Faramir is immediately, my king, this is awesome. Tell me what, command me, my king. He's right there with Faramir, but he doesn't want to do that with Eowyn. And my read of this has always been, 
simply kindness. This is an act of gentleness because he knows or believes that Eowyn is in love with him. And for him to be there would at the very least send the wrong message to her. It would at the very least confirm her belief or her desire that they are somehow fated for one another, that they are somehow, that they would at least be great together. And I'm not saying that they wouldn't be great together, right? If Aragorn was coming into this situation without any other romantic entanglements, he and Eowyn would actually be fantastic. What a power couple. Are you kidding me? King of Gondor and Arnor, King of the Reunited Kingdom and Queen of the Rohirrim? That would be fantastic. But yeah, that's not where we are. So he absents himself from the scene and gives instead her care back to her brother, the person who loves her most in the world. It is, again, kind of possible to read this as a little patriarchal, but but I think you've got to squint to want it. I, I, I think you have to want it, excuse me, and squint to see it in order to kind of give that accounting of the passing off of her hands from Aragorn to Aemer. Eowyn, Eowyn, cried Eomer amid his tears. Then he opened his eyes, then, but she opened her eyes, excuse me, and said, Eomer, what joy is this? For they said you were slain. Nay, but that was only the dark voices in my dream. How long have I been dreaming? The dark voices in her dream. This is the dark valley. We've seen Mary do this too, right? As he's walking back to Minas Tirith right before he meets Pippin and he's imagining the world around him as a long march toward a mausoleum. He's, he's imagining this march towards him. Oh, hello, Pippin. Have you come to bury me? Uh, this is what happens to you when you get too close to the Witch King of Angmar. And she's obviously still under that influence too. Okay, we have spent almost a half hour talking here, but uh, <laughs> good. let me see as I scroll back. Uh, yeah, Eric is saying, yeah, they'd be fantastic together. There's probably plenty of fanfic of it. I guarantee that there is, yes. Jackie's saying Aragorn's part was done. Eomer had the true connection with her. Jackie, that's a beautiful observation. I think you're exactly right. Aragorn, I mean, Aragorn has a true connection with her two, though it's a more complicated connection, right? Because he is, I honestly hadn't thought of this until just now, but bear with me. Aragorn is Faramir's king. Faramir is the son of the steward. He is now actually the steward of Minas Tirith. He is a man of Gondor and Aragorn is absolutely 100% his king. The Rohirrim don't owe immediate fealty to Aragorn they don't actually kneel to the king of Gondor. They didn't kneel to the steward of Gondor. They are allies of Gondor, but they have their own king, and it's Eomer, and he's right there. So I think that switching out the most regal figure in the room for a more specifically regal figure, switching out a person of grace and kindness and care for Eowyn for someone of greater grace and kindness and specifically care for Eowyn, I think does make a lot of sense as well as dodging that, uh, as well as dodging that, uh, yeah, awkward meet cute, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. Emily says, um, Depression is no joke, particularly without talk of therapy or medicine. She could totally fade away from this terrifying death for her and all those around her. I think the embodiment of depression, depression slash despair in literature shows a deep fear slash need to understand it in our collective psyche. Emily, I think that is absolutely astute. I think you are completely right. I think that we obviously go to some lengths within the pages of The Lord of the Rings and within fantasy fiction in general, right, to make metaphorical despair and depression. Well, I suppose we do in The Lord of the Rings and we don't in The Lord of the Rings. We also just deal with actual despair, right? Denethor's despair is actual. It is caused by magical means, but it is, it is genuine, psychologically speaking. Eowyn's despair may not be. Mary's despair, for example, certainly isn't, right? Mary is not despairing in and of himself. He is despairing because of the influence of the Witch King of Angmar, uh, the, the, the darkness that was contracted by the contact of his blade out there during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. So we make this metaphorical, but it is always tempting. And, you know, we can kind of bracket all of this with a discussion of Dementors, and we can bracket all of this with a, with a discussion of Expecto Patronum over in the Harry Potter universe, right? We can talk about, oh no, all you need to do to combat depression, actually, like the actual manifestation of depression and hopelessness and, and endless bitter cold, you can combat that just by thinking a happy thought and taking action. You need to be real careful. You need to be real, real careful if you're going to start walking down that road. In fact, take my advice. Don't start walking down that road. Keep the metaphors metaphorical. Observe them. Understand from them. Take from them their 
connotative emotional weight. Take from them their significance and their meaning that they have to impart. That's the purpose of storytelling. You should definitely do that thing. But don't mistake the metaphor for reality. Don't ever fall into the trap of thinking, well, this is actually talking about depression. It's not actually talking about depression. It's talking about a kind of, of magically refracted version of something that we might apply to depression in the real world. And again, I would remind you all of Professor Tolkien's stance on allegory, right? He's not interested in doing a beat for beat transposition of real emotional circumstance into the frame of the Lord of the Rings. This is applicable to depression, but he's not talking about depression. He's not talking about real world, you know, neurological depression. That's a very uh, clinically, you know, diagnosed depression. That's a very, very different thing. And we must always be careful when we're engaging with speculative fiction of any kind, fantasy, science fiction, horror, when we're engaging with these stories, we need to be careful to maintain a, a healthy distance and a, a, a prism of understanding, a prismatic understanding, we might even say, between the metaphor and reality. But Erica, thank you for bringing that up in the chat. I think that's a, that's a very important and very, very valuable point. Jackie's saying Aragorn is honorable to a fault. I think he leaves to avoid the awkwardness of Eowyn's feelings for him, but also to give brother, sister slash lord subject a private reunion after the death of their father figure. That also, yes, yes. I think that's, um, <laughs> and Ryan observing, keep metaphors metaphorical sounds like a line from I am the very model of a modern major general. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not an inappropriate addition to that, uh, to that book. You're absolutely right to the, uh, to the lyrics of that song. Yes, good. All right. Shane pointing out, Aragorn also has a lot of work to do within the Houses of Healing. He is there for many others also, including Mary Attic. Let's take a look at Mary. Gandalf and Pippin came to Mary's room, and there they found Aragorn standing by the bed. Poor old Mary, cried Pippin, and he ran to the bedside, for it seemed to him that his friend looked worse, and a grayness was in his face as if a weight of years of sorrow lay on him. And suddenly a fear seized Pippin that Mary would die. Do not be afraid, said Aragorn. I came in time, and I have called him back. He is weary now and grieved. And he has taken a hurt like the Lady Eowyn, daring to smite that deadly thing, but these evils can be amended, so strong and gay a spirit is in him. His grief he will not forget, but it will not darken his heart. It will teach him wisdom. Then Aragorn laid his hand on Mary's head, and passing his hand gently through the brown curls, he touched the eyelids and called him by name. And when the fragrance of Athalas stole through the room, like the scent of orchards and of heather in a sunshine full of bees, suddenly Mary awoke, and he said, I'm hungry. What's the time? Past supper time now, said Pippin, though I dare say I could bring you something if they will let me. They will indeed, said Gandalf, and anything else that this rider of Rohan may desire, if it can be found in Minas Tirith where his name is in honor. Good, said Mary. Then I would like supper first, and after that a pipe. At that his face clouded. No, not a pipe. I don't think I'll smoke again. Why not, said Pippin. Well, answered Mary slowly, he is dead. It has brought it all back to me. He said he was sorry he had never had a chance of talking herb lore with me. Almost the last thing he ever said. I shan't ever be able to smoke again without thinking of him. And that day, Pippin, when he rode up to Isengard and was so polite. Smoke, then, and think of him, said Aragorn. For he was a gentle heart and a great king and kept his oaths, and he rose out of the shadows to a last fair morning. Though your service to him was brief, it should be a memory glad and honorable to the end of your days. So much to discuss. Confirmation here from Aragorn. Okay, actually, before we even get to Aragorn's confirmation, look at Pippin. Pippin, remember, found Mary in Minas Tirith. He found him down by the gates. He found him staggering and ruined. Mary lost all but entirely to his hobbitishness. Mary completely unlike himself, suffering under the influence of the Witch King of Angmar here. But this is the moment when Pippin thinks, oh no, Mary might die. He ran to the bedside, for it seemed to him that his friend looked worse, and a grayness was in his face as if a weight of years and sorrow lay on him, and suddenly a fear seized Pippin that Mary would die. Is this the first time, Pip, that you're thinking of this? Peregrine, is this the first time that you're wondering, oh no, my buddy who just fought and potentially killed the Witch King of Angmar, he might die from this? That, I'm 
absolutely not. And I want to be very clear here, mocking Pippin for this. This is actually a great testament to the strength and the resilience of hobbits. It's exactly this strength and resilience that Aragorn refers to in the very next paragraph. He suffers an injury that is like that of the Lady Eowyn, but these evils can be amended, says Aragorn, so strong and gay a spirit is in him. His grief he will not forget, but it will not darken his heart, it will teach him wisdom. Remember the three possibilities that Aragorn laid out for Eowyn coming back? She might awake to hope, she might awake to forgetfulness, she might awake to despair. Mary is possessed of, I don't want to say a stronger spirit, right? I don't want to elevate Merry and Pippin here. I don't want to elevate hobbits in general here. They are not more courageous or more possessed of spirit, whether we're talking colloquially and informally, or we're actually leaning into the Tolkienian, you know, use of, of Fea here, right? They are not possessed of more spirit than the writers of Rohan, and certainly not more than of the Lady Eowyn. But they are possessed of a resilience, it will not darken his heart. So strong and gay a spirit is in him. His grief he will not forget. He's not going to wake to forgetfulness, but it will not darken his heart. He's not going to wake to despair. It will teach him wisdom. And in wisdom, as we discussed extensively last time, when we talked about the underpinnings of Tolkien's entire cosmology here, Tolkien's entire philosophy here, when we talked about the idea that beneath the world, behind the world, in every possible direction, there is the light. Greater wisdom, greater understanding is always, always going to lead to hope. It is never going to, because the wise acknowledge that they can never know the outcome perfectly. And the wisest acknowledge that actually the world does bend toward justice. Actually, there is a great grace in the universe. Mary, it seems, is going to waken to hope. So he calls him by name when the fragrance of Athalas stole through the room, like the scent of orchards and of heather in the sunshine full of bees. Wait, is that what Athalas smells like? Because that definitely wasn't what Athalas smelled like a minute ago, or five minutes ago when we healed Faramir. No, this is a Shire-specific form of Athalas. Under Aragorn's influence here, the Athalas is creating an air that is most restorative and recuperative for Mary specifically, it would seem to me. Because when we think of orchards and of heather in the sunshine full of bees, presumably there are beehives nearby, presumably there is honey nearby, and probably a loaf of bed breaking, and maybe even a pie cooling on a windowsill somewhere very nearby, and lest we forget, a keg of good brown ale. Yeah, this is a hobbit vision of restoration, of health, and of of a well-ordered and hopeful life. So Mary wakes, I am hungry. Classic hobbit beat there. What is the time? Past supper time now, said Pippin, though I dare say I could bring you something if they will let me. They will indeed, said Gandalf. They will absolutely let you and anything else that this writer of Rohan may desire if it can be found in Minas Tirith, where his name is in honor. No, he's a hero. We know it. The men of Gondor know it. Hobbits are not going to fall under the radar anymore. Hobbits are not going to go overlooked like a piece of baggage anymore. Good, said Mary. Then I think I would like supper first and after that a pipe and then his face clouded. No, not a pipe. I don't think I'll smoke again. He is dead. It has brought it all back to me. It seems as though that, it seems as though he did wake to a kind of forgetfulness, actually. He did kind of rouse and immediately think of food and think of smoking and then the memory of smoking triggered his memory of Theoden. He said he, was, I love that we don't credit Theoden by name here. He is dead. It has brought it all back to me. He said he was sorry he had never had a chance of talking Erblor with me, almost the last thing he ever said. I shan't ever be able to smoke again without thinking of him. And that day, Pippin, when he rode up to Isengard and was so polite, smoke then and think of him, says Aragorn. We've talked before, and we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk again, particularly when we start talking about the Silmarillion, about the connection between beauty and tragedy, beauty and sadness in The Lord of the Rings. These two things are completely intertwined. The most beautiful things are also the most sad, and the most sad things are also the most beautiful. And there is here an acknowledgement of that from Aragorn. For he was a gentle heart and a great king and kept his oaths, and he rose out of the shadows to the last fair morning. The oaths that he took, right? The oaths of service and the oaths of alliance, his oaths of kingship. He honored his word, and in the end came good. In the end, he blew asunder that, that, that great horn and rode out across the fields of the Palinor and died as few men get the chance to die. He absolutely fulfilled his, his ultimate destiny, I suppose. 
Though your service to him was brief, it should be a memory glad and honorable to the end of your days. It should be glad and honorable and, yes, sad, but beautiful for the combination of those things. So that's Mary. Yes, Wilhelm Scream observing there's something Dickensian here in Mary's language, recalling Theoden and his kindness and regrets. Oh, look, at, at, yes, it's so simple. It's so, Dickensian is actually a really good poll, Wilhelm Scream. I'm, I, I'm not sure that I'd ever made that connection before, but I think you're absolutely right. It is, it is simple, it is elegaic, but it is also, it is very anchored and naturalistic, right? We're not getting high order language here. We're not getting Prince Imrahil of Dol Amroth kind of declaiming here on the page. He is dead. It has brought it all back to me. He said he was sorry. This is very simple and, and plain Hobbit language that is happening here and all the more powerful for that. Yeah. Tom saying, no one connects sadness to beauty like Tolkien. I think I'd encountered the concept before, but it never hit home until the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I, uh, Tolkien is the absolute master, right? I, I'm going to take nothing away from him in this regard. He is the absolute master. He does it better than anyone. I mean anyone. He is drawing on a medieval tradition, I suppose. That's in part a consequence of the medieval belief that we live in a fallen world and, and that the great things have passed and we can look back longingly at them and find virtue in that longing. The fact that we are disconnected from them actually speaks to to a goodness within us, that, that we feel that, that tug and that sadness. The sadness there is proof of our virtue in a sense, but also, you know, different medieval ideas about chivalry and about the passing from the world. It's, it's a very complicated kind of uh, cosmological template that we're presented with there and that we're presented with here too, I should say. But Tolkien manages to distill it and anchor it and unify it and communicate it better than literally anyone. It's it's a knockout. And if you like that stuff in The Lord of the Rings, buckle up for the Silmarillion, baby, because yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about, about weeping when we get to the Silmarillion. Okay. Let's get into our last slide. Hey, I said that we weren't going to make it to chapter 10. I was so right because this is the last slide of chapter 8. Aragorn and Gandalf went now to the warden of the Houses of Healing and they counseled him that Faramir and Eowyn should remain there and still be tended with care for many days. The Lady Eowyn, said Aragorn, will wish soon to rise and depart, but she should not be permitted to do so if you can in any way restrain her at least and until at least 10 days be passed. As for Faramir, said Gandalf, he must soon learn that his father is dead. But the full tale of the madness of Denethor should not be told to him until he is quite healed and has duties to do. See that Beragond and the Perian who were present do not speak of him of these things yet. And the other Perian, Mariadoc, who is under my care, what of him? said the warden. It is likely that he will be fit to arise tomorrow for a short while, said Aragorn. Let him do so if he wishes. He may walk a little in the care of his friends. They are a remarkable race, said the warden, nodding his head. Very tough in the fiber, I deem. At the doors of the houses, many were already gathered to see Aragorn, and they followed after him. And when at last he had supped, men came and prayed that he would heal their kinsmen or their friends, whose lives were in peril through hurt or wound, or who lay under the black shadow. And Aragorn arose and went out, and he sent for the sons of Elrond, and together they laboured far into the night. And word went through the city, The king is come again indeed, and they named him Elfstone because of the green stone that he wore, and so the name which it was foretold at his birth that he should bear was chosen for him by his own people. And when he could labor no more, he cast his cloak about him and slipped out of the city and went to his tent just ere dawn and slept for a little. And in the morning the banner of Dol Amroth, a white ship like a swan upon blue water, floated from the tower, and men looked up and wondered if the coming of the king had been but a dream. So two parts to this final reading from chapter eight. Aragorn and Gandalf going to the warden and saying, yeah, Faramir, Eowyn, they definitely need to stay here for at least 10 days. If you can find any way of restraining Eowyn, who is absolutely going to want to leave as soon as she can stand up, if you can find some way to keep her here, please, please do that. Also, don't tell Faramir about his dad until, and this is really interesting, he must soon learn that his father is dead, says Gandalf, but the full tale of the madness of Denethor should not be told to him until he is quite healed and has duties to do. Two things. A, he needs to be healed. B, he needs to have duties to do. We need to allow Faramir's devotion to his duty and to the service of his city and of his people to balance, to be aligned against, to stand in conflict with any potential grief, any potential despair that might spring from his father's madness. Give him a job to do and he'll rise to the challenge because that is who Faramir is. 
see the Berigond and the Parian who were present. Parian, of course, as we discussed last week, just just halfling, right? That's just the the Gondorian Cinderin for halfling. See that Berigond and the Parian who were present do not speak of him, not speak to him of these things yet. If you could just keep them quiet for a bit, that would be great. And the other Parian, Mariatic, who's under my care, what of him? And Aragorn says, well, he's probably going to be fine. Let him do so if he wishes. He may walk a little in the care of his friends. Like, he's going to bounce back. Let me tell you about hobbits. And the warden says, you don't have to tell me about hobbits. They're a remarkable race, said the warden, nodding his hand, his head. Very tough in the fiber, I deem. Yeah, pretty tough in the fiber, it turns out. Eowyn is going to be laid out for 10 days. She needs 10 days of constant care before she can even think about leaving her room. Mary? He's probably going to be fine. He's, he'll be up and about tomorrow. It's, he should walk in the company of his friends, but he's going to be fine. I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Hobbits are resilient. Hobbits are, are doughty stalwart fellows, and that is an important part of our understanding as we move toward book six. Then we see this transition, right? Out of this attributed dialogue, they're a remarkable race, said the warden, nodding his head. Very tough in the fiber, I deem. This very casual kind of conversation between the warden of the Houses of Healing, Gandalf, and the returning king, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, King LSR. At the doors of the houses, many were already gathered to see Aragorn, and they followed after him. And when at last he had supped, he had eaten, men came and prayed that he would heal their kinsmen or their friends whose lives were in peril through hurt or wound or who lay under the black shadow. And Aragorn arose and went out and he sent for the sons of Elrond. Of course, Elrond is acknowledged as the greatest healer in Middle-earth. He is the greatest lore master and the greatest healer in Middle-earth. And the sons of Elrond presumably have inherited their father's trade a little bit. So they too can go out and heal. Together they labored far into the night and word went through the city. The king has come again indeed and they named him Elfstone because of the green store, uh, stone that he wore. So the name that which it was foretold at his birth that he should bear was chosen for him by his own people. The people of Minas Tirith do not know that one of the names associated with Aragorn is Elfstone. They don't know that. That has not filtered out into the public consciousness at this point. And yet, nonetheless, they name him Elfstone because of the green stone that he wears on his chest, upon his breast, an emerald, right? That is... The fulfillment of the prophecy that was laid upon, Ar or a uh, minor part of, of foretelling, I suppose, that was laid upon Aragorn at the moment of his birth. Aragorn, son of Arathorn, who shall be called Elfstone. And sure enough, here it is. It is happening right now. The people of Minas Tirith spontaneously decide to call him that, and it counts because they are his people. And when he could labor no more, he cast his cloak about him, casting that cloak of Lorien about him. Remember when, uh, when uh, Eomer and Imrahil come into, uh, into Minas Tirith and they meet with Gandalf and a man who was cloaked? They were just hanging out at the gate with Aragorn, who said that he wouldn't come into the city. So they come into the city, they meet with Gandalf and this man in a gray cloak. And they're like, well, should we send for Aragorn? Aragorn should probably be here, right? Aragorn should lead the city. And he's like, ha ha, it's me. No one expects me in my cloak of Lorien. That's how presumably he manages to slip out of the city unobserved. He cast his cloak about him. Him and slipped out of the city and went to his tent just ere dawn and slept for a little. And then when the dawn comes, the banner of Dol Amroth is over the city as it should be, because Imrahil is going to be, well, another steward of, of Gondor, I suppose. He's the next in line since Faramir is laid up in the Houses of Healing at this point. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see here. Good. We're, we're doing good. Oh, Jackie drawing the connection between Aragorn and Jesus. Wow. Uh... I definitely don't have time to get into that tonight, but that is one of the more compelling bits of allegorical reading that you can do with the Lord of the Rings, right? People talk about the Lord of the Rings as an allegory for the First World War, as an allegory for the Second World War, as an allegory for Tolkien's experience going through both of those wars, like, like a very specific personal biographical kind of allegory, and that all falls apart pretty quickly. Like, it's, it's pretty rudimentary, and you need to... Again, you need to want it in order to see it at all. But connecting Tolkien's faith and the specifics of Tolkien's faith to structures and archetypes in The Lord of the Rings is really interesting. Clearly, Aragorn is demonstrating regal and kingly traits throughout this, right? In that way, he is like Jesus, who also displayed kingly and regal traits. They are, in a sense, it's not that Aragorn is reflective of Jesus in this moment, I would argue. It is that both Aragorn and Jesus are reflective of a kind of, of pure regal quality, that they are kings of man, in effect, right? 
I don't have time to get into the deconstruction of Aragorn as a Jesus figure. If you guys are interested, we could maybe put something together right at the end of the Lord of the Rings and, and talk a little about that. Talk about maybe some of the, talk about some of the big allegories and then talk about where they falter and crack into applicability and why applicability is that much more valuable for that. That would be a really interesting uh, extra session to add in. Yeah, good. What? Yes, there's always time for Jesus, says Jackie. <laughs> always time. We'll, we'll just, we'll take the time. Yes. Okay, let's get into... Um, Good, good. Let's get into, uh, yeah, as Tom is saying, so the Aragorn-Jesus connection is applicable but not allegorical. Um, mm, yes, yes, in a way. Okay, let me, let me kind of tease that out. Yes, it is absolutely applicable. If you see the connection, then it is applicable, right? Remember that Tolkien dislikes allegory because it rests in the purposeful dom uh, domination of the author. That is to say that the author dictates the allegory, but the reader teases out and distills and discovers the applicability. So if you can see traits of Jesus in Aragorn, if you can see a connection there, then yes, it is absolutely applicable. My argument is, I would say that rather than being directly reflective of Jesus, both rather than being a, a Jesus figure in this book, the way that, you know, Aslan is a Jesus figure by the time that we get to the Chronicles of Narnia, rather than that being so directly connected, I think I would argue that both Aragorn and Jesus in Tolkien's concept of, of goodness and virtue, both Aragorn and Jesus embody qualities of kingliness which are also shared by other other historical figures and quasi-historical figures and outright mythic figures, right? Like, is is King Arthur a Jesus figure? Well, yes, in some versions of his story, but also he stands apart just as another example of that archetype, right? Does that make sense? Anyway, we must move on. We must get into chapter nine, the last debate. It is one thing for me not to finish chapter 10 tonight. It's quite another for me not to finish chapter nine. Chapter nine, the last debate, a very short chapter in which very big things happen. Let's look at uh, the morning after with Legolas and Gimli. The morning came after the day of battle and it was fair with light clouds and the wind turning westward. Legolas and Gimli were early abroad, and they begged leave to go up into the city, for they were eager to see Merry and Pippin. "'It's good to learn they're still alive,' said Gimli, "'for they caused us great pains in our march over Rohan, and I would not have such pains all wasted.' Together, the elf and the dwarf entered Minas Tirith, and folk that saw them pass marveled to see such companions, for Legolas was fair of face beyond the measure of man, and he sang an elven song in a clear voice as he walked in the morning. But Gimli stalked beside him, stroking his beard and staring about him. There is some good stonework here, he said as he looked at the walls, but also some that is less good, and the streets could be better contrived. When Aragorn comes into his own, I shall offer him the service of stone rites of the mountain, and we will make this a town to be proud of. They need more gardens, said Legolas. The houses are dead, and there is too little here that grows and is glad. If Aragorn comes into his own, the people of the wood shall bring him birds that sing and trees that do not die. At length they came to the Prince Simmerhill, and Legolas looked at him and bowed low, for he saw that here indeed was one who had elven blood in his veins. Hail, Lord, he said, it is long since the people of Nimrodel left the woodlands of Lorien, and yet still one may see that not all sailed from Amroth's haven west over water. So it is said in the lore of my land, said the prince, yet never has one of the fair folk been seen there for years beyond count, and I marvel to see one here now in the midst of sorrow and war. What do you seek? I am one of the nine companions who set out from uh, set out with Mithrandir from Imladris, said Legolas, and with this dwarf, my friend, I came with the Lord Aragorn. But now we wish to see our friends, Mariandic and Peregrine, who are in your keeping, we are told. You will find them in the houses of healing, and I will lead you thither, said Imrahil. It will be enough if you send one to guide us, Lord, said Legolas, for Aragorn sends this message to you. He does not wish to enter the city again at this time, yet there is need for the captains to hold council at once, and he prays that you and Eomer of Rohan will come down to his tents as soon as may be. Mithrandir is already there. We will come, said Imrahil, and they parted with, with courteous words. Hey, remember Legolas and Gimli? Previously seen dashing into the pods of the dead, previously getting one brief cameo in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields as they leap from the ships, and Legolas the elf was there, and Gimli the dwarf, and yay! That's it. That's all that we've seen of them, basically, through the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, but now we're catching up with these fascinating characters, these characters who have been pulled into this story that is not entirely of their own making and not completely of their own understanding. They begin, of course, by wanting to see Merry and Pippin, and we get this grumbling from Gimli, which reads to me, of course, as being completely inauthentic. This is, this is dwarven humor and also that Hmm. Dwarven disavowal of sentiment, I suppose. It is good to learn they're still alive, said Gimli, for they cost us great pains in our march over Rohan, and I would not have such pains all wasted. 
And you can imagine Legolas just smirking as they walk through the city as he's singing in his clear voice in his elven song. But Gimli stalked beside him, stroking his beard and staring about him. There is some good stonework here, but also some that is less good and the streets could be better contrived. When Aragorn comes into his own, I shall offer him the service of stone rights of the mountain and we will make this a town to be proud of. Indeed, Aragorn is going to mention that in just a couple of pages time when they're talking about rebuilding the Great Gate, right? Stonemasons can be sent from Erebor and they will craft us an even better gate. We will laugh at the memory of the gate that was taken down by Gron the mighty battering ha battering ram. Instead, we're going to have an even better gate crafted by uh, crafted by the dwarves of Erebor. And Legolas sees the counterpoint. They need more gardens, said Legolas. The houses are dead, and there is too little here that grows and is glad. If Aragorn comes into his own, the people of the wood shall bring him birds that sing and trees that do not die. And I think that you could, were you so inclined, spend a good hour talking about the specifics of the dwarven relationship with the future and with fate and the elven relationship with future and the uh, with the future and fate here based on how they talk about aragorn gimli says when aragorn comes into his own and legolas says if aragorn comes into his own and i find that completely fascinating right because the dwarves of all people okay let's invert this actually the elves have a memory of the music. The elves have a memory of the Ainulindale. They remember at least the concept that the world is is ordered and preordained, right? That there is a plan that is unfolding through the march of history. So if Legolas says, when Aragorn comes in, that would imply that Legolas believes that Aragorn's return to Gondor is foretold and that, that it is actually absolutely a part of the music. That would make a lot of sense. Dwarves have been through the ringer since, you know, the moment of their creation by Aule. So it would make sense if Gimli was a little less certain about this. If, if would make more sense in the mouth of Gimli. But here we get this inverted. Gimli is, sure, when Aragorn comes into his own, says Gimli, is this personal loyalty? Is this personal faith in Aragorn? Is this just certainty that, that things will occur? Is this a kind of um, recognition of the role of kings that we associate with, uh, with dwarves, thinking back to the pages of The Hobbit and thinking back to how important the line of kings is to the dwarves in that book? Maybe. And then if, says Legolas, recognizing perhaps that the future is unknowable, that that only a fool or only the unwise know beyond all measure what will happen next, right? We've been talking about despair so much through book five that we're accustomed to thinking of this only in the most negative terms. You despair when the outcome is beyond all doubt, when you know absolutely what is going to happen and it's going to be bad. But the wise presumably in their acknowledgement that you can never know how things are going to turn out also acknowledge that you can never be sure that good things are going to happen either. Is this Legolas demonstrating that kind of that kind of wisdom that keeps you in this ambiguous space where, well, you know, things are going to happen. Hey, never say never. I don't know. It sure seems likely that the return of the king is going to happen in about 60 pages time. Sure seems like that. that's a thing that's going to occur. I mean, he's back already. He's kind of returned already, but maybe we'll get the real deal in just a few chapters time. But hey, who knows? Anything could happen. I find that really interesting. I'm not going to spend half an hour talking about it. I could, but I'm going to resist the urge. Then they meet with Prince Imrahil. Legolas looked at him and bowed low, for he saw that here indeed was one who had elven blood in his veins. In fact, he does. Um, prince Imrahil has elven blood because the first prince of Dol Amroth, Galador, was the son of Imrazor the man and Mithralas the elf. Elven blood has apparently passed down true in the line of the princes of Dol Amroth, which reminds me, by the way, that I don't think I ever talked about Dol Amroth. I don't think that I ever talked about this little... Uh, this little uh, principality on the Bay of Belfalas, right? I don't think I ever had the opportunity to note that. Of course, we've heard the word Amroth before, and it's interesting that that uh, Legolas should here mention uh, Nimrodal, right? Um, Hail Lord, it is long since the people of Nimrodal left the woodlands of Lorien, and yet still one may see that not all sail from Amroth's haven west over water, right? Do you remember the story of Nimrodal? Do you remember the song that Legolas sang as we approached uh, as we approached Lothlorien, as we crossed the river named for Nimrodal of the elven maiden who wanted to leave Lothlorien and pass into the west and then grew lost or was stranded in the mountains or who, who disappeared anyway, who fell into the water is, is my belief, listening carefully to Legolas's song there. But Nimrodel was lost. And then you'll remember that Amroth was waiting for her on the ship, the, the, the prince who loved her. He was waiting for her on the ship to the south and the ship sailed overnight while he was resting. And then he awoke to find the ship at sea. He leapt from the deck and tried to swim back to shore and also was lost. That's Amroth. And Dol Amroth, literally translated Hill of Amroth, 
is the hill where the ship departed from, in effect. It's the hill closest to the site of his loss slash death. So that's why Dol Amroth is Dol Amroth, and that is why Prince Imrahil is oftentimes depicted as being beardless, right? It's this passage that suggests to us that Prince Imrahil is beardless because those who are of elven blood do not grow beards. So that seems to be the case, and that's probably why Legolas recognizes him so powerfully in this moment. So they introduce themselves. I am of the nine companions who set up with Mithrandir from Inladris. Rivendell, of course, if it's been a while since we've talked about Rivendell as Imladris and you're coming in late to this discussion, that's what Imladris is. It is Rivendell. And with this dwarf, my friend, I came with the Lord Aragorn, but now we wish to see our friends Mariatic and Peregrine. And Imrahil does the courtly thing. He does the kingly thing and says, yes, I will take you there. Let me show you to the houses of healing. And they're like, no, actually, Aragorn really needs you. We need to have a war council. You need to have a war council out on the actual battlefield, right? Aragorn is right now near the gate, but still stationed on the Pelennor fields. Like he is still out there where the battle took place, which is in its own way kind of appropriate. So they separate, uh, they part with courteous words, and we get this very short exchange between Legolas and Gimli. That is a fair lord and a great captain of men, said Legolas. If Gondor has such men still in these days of fading, great must have been its glory in the days of its rising. And doubtless the good stonework is the older and was wrought in the first building, said Gimli. It is ever so with the things that men begin. There is a frost in spring or a blight in summer and they fail of their promise. Yet seldom do they fail of their seed, said Legolas. And that will lie in the dust and rot to spring up again in times and places unlooked for. The deeds of men will outlast us, Gimli. And yet come to naught in the end, but might have been, I guess, said the dwarf. To that the elves know not the answer, said Legolas. Heavy foreshadowing for the fourth age, you guys. Heavy foreshadowing for the very future of Middle-earth. We're going to talk, as I mentioned right at the beginning of tonight's session, next week about what is going on with the dwarves and the elves right now. Where are all the dwarves? Where are all the elves? Why has Thranduil, why has Dian not sent troops to assist here? Why are they not assaulting the Black Gate too? Like, wh where are they right now? There is a very good explanation for where they all are right now, as we'll dip into next week. But we must remember that we're coming to the end of the third age. No one in the story knows, well, I suppose actually everyone in the story knows this, right? You think of Gandalf riding up to the, the gates of Minas Tirith in the first place, come what may, you know, I, I need to talk to Denethor while he is still steward, doesn't matter what happens next, but these days are done, something is going to end, it may end well, it's looking a little shaky right now, it's probably going to end badly, but but things are coming to an end, things are, are, are coming to a, a natural piece of punctuation here, we're about to move into the fourth age, and we are going to see the further fall of man, and we are going to fall in exactly this way. That is a fair lord and a great captain of men, says Legolas, hey, that Emeril, we just met him, he's great, I love that guy. If Gondor has, has such men still in these days of fading, if Gondor can muster a man like that today, when, you know, things are a little shaky in Gondor, great must have been its glory in the days of its rising. Can you imagine what it was like when Gondor was founded? When when the men of Numenor came to Middle-earth and built this great... Wow, that must have been spectacular. And doubtless the good stonework is the old Odin was wrought in the first building, said Gimli, and acknowledging, yeah, actually, those men, pretty great. Like, those men... They could do a thing or two. They know how to put a brick on top of another brick, let me tell you. It is ever so with the things that men begin. There's a frost in spring or a blight in summer and they fail of their promise. Men are inconstant in a way that dwarves and by extension elves too are not. Men falter. Men fall. Men have great plans. Men have great ideas. Men have great potential. But they don't follow through. They always decline. Yet seldom do they fail of their seed, said Legolas, and that will lie in the dust and rot to spring up again in times and places unlooked for. The deeds of men will not last us, Gimli. Yes, says Legolas, their singular plans, their singular commitments, the things that men seek to undertake, the things that, that men seek to do to the world, the, the effect that they seek to have upon the world. Yeah, individually, these things are going to falter. You're right. He's not disagreeing with Gimli at this point. Yes, you're right. There's always a frost in spring or a blight in summer. Yeah, we've all seen that too. But their seed doesn't fail. And we can think literally there, right? It's a little ambiguous, but we can be thinking literally there of the seed of man, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what individual men fail to do because there are always going to be so many more of them. They reproduce so much faster than basically any other race in Middle Earth, right? They reproduce faster than, than dwarves, certainly elves, certainly hobbits, certainly orcs. We don't know for sure. I mean, it's presumable that orcs reproduce. However, orcs reproduce pretty quickly. That would account for the, the mass hordes of Mordor, of course, during this war. But yeah, men procreate. That is what they do. But also, I think metaphorically, we can see this as as seeds of ambition, 
of desire, of inspiration, of leadership, that yes, their specific plans can falter, but their greatness cannot be completely conquered. It cannot be completely diminished. If they undertake the building of Minas Tirith and it goes awry and now the streets are terrible and some of the stonework's not great, uh, yeah, okay. But the spark that drove them to create Minas Tirith in the first place will persist and it may be eclipsed now. It may be darkened now, but it will rise again. That's what men do. The deeds of men will outlast us, Gimli, says Legolas, with great foresight and acuity, and yet come to naught in the end, but might have beens, I guess, said the dwarf. Yeah, okay, they probably will outlast us, but it's only going to be a story of unfulfilled potential. It's only going to be a story of partially constructed cities. It's only going to be a story of things that could have been great if only men had been capable of sticking to a plan. To that, the elves know not the answer, said Legolas, brackets, diplomatically. We'll circle back around to this in just a moment. We do, though, have to talk about, um, yes, yeah, start pointing out that in the summer, alien orcs multiplied like flies. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. There certainly are lots of them. Um boiling out of the misty mountains like ants from an anthill, right? As, uh, as, uh, Frodo sees when he's on top of Amon Hand. Like, yeah. Orcs are populous. That, that seems to be very true. Yeah. Good. All right. Let's, um, interesting. Shane says Gimli's view is still consistent with a deterministic view. Men will always be around and it is their doom to not fulfill all that they want. <sighs> you know what, Shane? I hadn't thought of it in exactly that way. Because when I think about this, I'm thinking about it in terms of the decline, and I'm thinking about it in terms of the fourth age. I'm thinking about the 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 root concept of Tolkien's legendarium, that this is, in fact, the ancient history of our world. So it is necessary that the elves depart and the dwarves diminish and the hobbits disappear and that men are less now than they used to be. But this is also, I think you're right, reflective of the fact that men alone are not intended for Arda, that men alone do not belong to the world. Men are going to go on. They live brief mortal lives and then leave the world behind in ways that elves and dwarves and presumably hobbits do not. So their inconstancy is perhaps a thing that is emergent from their underlying knowledge that this is not their world, right? The, the deeds of men, the, the, the great constructions of men, the, the actions of men within the frame of the world, that's never what men are for. That's not what men are about. That is actually what elves are for, right? Elves are to, elves exist to be in the world. Dwarves exist to be in the world. Hobbits, again, dubiously, we just don't know, but we might speculate. Hobbits too, in that hobbits also diminish as we move into the fourth age and approach the modern world, right? Hobbits also diminish and disappear, so presumably they are more like elves and dwarves in that regard than they are like men. Men, they're just here for a bit. This is like a day club. This is like daycare for, for men. They show up, they kind of hang around, they have a good time. Maybe they build some blocks. Maybe they knock the blocks over. Eh, it doesn't really matter because at four o'clock, their parents are going to come and pick them up and they're going to actually go home. Elves and dwarves don't get that option. So the idea of permanence is necessarily going to be more appealing to elves and dwarves than it is for men because men are just impermanent and that is their great virtue that is what makes men special that is what distinguishes them yeah yeah good all right let's um ryan says that he's working on a bingo card with all the alisterisms oh boy please don't do that 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 sounds very very bad <laughs> Good, good, good. It was in the original drinking game, as Erica points out here, as, as Angela points out here. Yeah, um, it's been a while, I think. I, I've tried to uh, tried to distill that out of my uh, out of my uh, habitual uh, quirks of vernacular here in the podcast space, but um, still imperfectly. All right. It's five after 10. That's the thing that I do all the time is time check so that I can see how many slides I'm going to get through. Let's move on to a uh, slide about seagulls. Let's have a slide about seagulls. Why not? We're talking about the future here as we segue out from uh, from the, the fate and the inconstancy of man to the future of elves. And now Legolas fell silent while the others talked and he looked out against the sun and as he gazed, he saw white seabirds beating up the river. Look, he cried, gulls! They're flying far inland. A wonder they are to me and a trouble to my heart. Never in all my life had I met them until we came to Pilar here. And then I heard them crying in the air as we rode to the Battle of the Ships. Then I stood still, forgetting war in Middle-earth, for their wailing voices spoke to me of the sea. The sea. Alas, I have not yet beheld it. But deep in the hearts of all my kindred lies the sea longing, which is perilous to stir. Alas, for the gulls, no peace shall I have again under beach or under elm. Say not so, said Gimli. There are countless things still to see in Middle-earth and great works to do. 
But if all the fair folk take to the havens, it will be a duller world for those who are doomed to stay. Dull and dreary indeed, said Mary. You must not go to the havens, Legolas. There will always be some folk big or little, and even a few wise dwarves like Gimli who need you. At least I hope so, though I feel somehow that the worst of this war is still to come. How I wish it was all over, and well over. Don't be so gloomy, cried Pippin. The sun is shining, and here we are together for a day or two at least. I want to hear more about you all. Come, Gimli, you and Legolas have mentioned your strange journey with Strider about a dozen times already this morning, but you haven't told me anything about it. The sun may shine here, said Gimli, but there are memories of that road that I do not wish to recall out of the darkness. Had I known what was before me, I think that not for any friendship would I have taken the paths of the dead. Insert wobbly flashback cinematography here as Gimli transitions into the telling of the story of the Pods of the Dead. More on that in just a minute because gulls, you guys. When Legolas gets to Pilargir in the company of Aragorn prior to their uh, you catastrophic arrival at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, the taking of the Corsair ships, right? When he arrives at Pilargir, he sees for his first time, uh, for the first time in his life, gulls. And they sing to him of the sea. He has not even yet seen the sea, but it doesn't matter because seagulls are enough. Their song, their, their evocation of the sea has robbed him of peace. It has robbed him of stillness. No peace shall I have again under beech or under elm. Deep in the hearts of all my kindred lies the sea longing, and it, which it is perilous to stir. Why is it perilous to stir the sea longing? Well, because it's one thing if you live in... I don't know, Mirkwood or Rivendell or Lothlorien come to that. It's one thing if the closest you come to the sea is a river, even a great river like the Anduin, right? You're, you're a good distance inland there and you don't necessarily have to think about the sea, except in the abstract. You know that elves are attracted to the sea. You know that eventually all the elves, in theory at least, will return across the sea. They will travel into the west and they will leave Middle-earth behind, but you don't have to think about it. But once it is stirred, once you have had some experience of it, even a tangential experience of it, then you are left with an unquiet desire. You are left with an irresolvable desire while you choose to stay in Middle-earth to take to the sea. Gulls, they are flying far inland, a wonder they are to me and a trouble to my heart. Never in all my life had I met them until we came to Pilargir, and there I heard them crying in the air as we rode to the Battle of the Ships. Then I stood still, forgetting war in Middle-earth, for their wailing voices spoke to me of the sea, the sea, alas. Legolas is aware of his ultimate fate. He's aware of the ultimate fate of all elves. Yeah, the longing for the sea, the sea as... A reflection of the Ainur Lindale itself, right? A reflection of the music of the Ainur itself, the the path home, the path to fulfillment. All of the elves in Middle Earth are are tarrying there. They are lingering there. They have been lingering there for thousands of years, and they believe that there is goodness to be done in Middle Earth. But still, ultimately, this is. Yeah, this is not their forever home. They are going to take ship and they are going to pass into the West. Not literally into the West, of course. Valinor is not on the sphere of Arda anymore, but they are going to take the straight road. They are going to travel metaphorically into the you know, first star on the, uh, second star on the right and straight on till morning kind of deal. That is going to happen, and Legolas can feel that desire now stirring in his breast. He has been... He has been made unquiet. He has been made unsettled by his experiences following after Aragorn, as has Gimli. Gimli here is going to give us the account of the Paths of the Dead. But say not so, there are countless things still to see in Middle-earth and great works to do. But if all the fair folk take to the heavens, it will be a duller world for those who are doomed to say. I mean, I don't want to necessarily crib off of, you know, the bad lip reading videos, but Gimli is effectively saying, seagulls, stop it now. We don't want to distract Legolas from the great work that he can do here in Middle-earth. We want him to actually stick around. Dull and dreary indeed, said Mary. You must not go to the havens, Legolas. Like, you cannot take ship and then go into the west, Legolas. You've got to stick around here with, uh, with us. There will always be some folk, big or little, and even a few wise dwarves like Gimli who need you. And then we segue out of this, right? You, no, of course you can't go, Legolas. Don't be crazy. We need you here. There are always going to be people who need you. Just don't go into the west. I know, well... Actually, Mary doesn't know. Mary clearly does not realize that that is, in fact, the fate of all elves, that that is what Legolas is going to do someday. And as the years pass, the tug toward the sea will become all the stronger for Legolas. Again, part of that quiet tragedy of Middle-earth, that beautiful tragedy, that beautiful sadness of Middle-earth. So instead, we transition back. Don't be so gloomy, said Pippin. The sun is shining. Here we are together for a day or two. At least I want to hear more about you. Well, come, Gimli. You and Legolas have mentioned your strange journey with Strider about a dozen times already this morning. 
How about you tell us that whole story? How about you just give us the account of what happened after you went into the Paths of the Dead, or I guess after you left the Stone of Eric, because that's the part that readers of some theoretical book have not yet had a chance to hear. I want to quote here. Um, I'm going to quote here from a letter that was written in 1957 by Professor Tolkien to Caroline Everett. I'm reading here from the uh, from the fantastic Reader's Companion to the Lord of the Rings. This is a very good book, and this quote just uh, really stood out to me today. I love this. So Tolkien is writing about the difficulty of pulling together the narrative strands of Book 5 in particular of the Lord of the Rings, and talking about the decision to tell the story of Aragorn's march along the southern edge of Gondor here, rather than actually just telling us the story as it happens, as pretty much every other event in the book has been relayed to us. He writes, The last volume was naturally the most difficult, since by that time I had accumulated a large number of narrative debts and set some awkward problems of presentation and drawing together the separated threads. But the problem was not so much what happened, about which I was only occasionally in doubt, as to how to order the account of it. The solution is imperfect, inevitably. Obviously, the chief problem of this sort is how to bring up Aragorn unexpectedly at the raising of the siege and yet inform readers of what he had been up to. Told in full in its proper place, Volume 3, Book 5, Chapter 2, though it would have been better for the episode, it would have destroyed Chapter 6. Told in full, or indeed in part, in retrospect, it would have been out of date and it would hold up the action as it does in Chapter 9. I just want to quote the, the very last part here. The solution imperfect was to cut down the whole episode, which in full would belong rather to a saga, a saga of Aragorn Arathorn's son than to my story, and tell the ending of it briefly during the inevitable pause after the Battle of the Pelennor. Tolkien acknowledges that this is imperfect. This is just a best fit kind of narrative solution. He can't tell it in chapter two, right? Because if he tells the story of what happens to Aragorn after we leave the Stone of Eric and Habarad unfurls the banner and lo, it was dark and no one could see the banner anyway, if he tells the story then, then there is no moment of eucatastrophe, uh, eucatastrophe for the reader when we get to the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. He has to shroud Aragorn's story in darkness so that we can get the surprise, so that we can get the eucatastrophic arrival of, oh no, it's the Corsairs, oh yay, it's Aragorn, right? That is so powerful, the most important piece of eucatastrophe in the book, to tell Aragorn's story prior to that would create an interesting dramatic tension. It would be a different kind of story, but the reader would not get that cathartic rush of, of eucatastrophic joy. I don't know exactly what the right word to account for my emotional response to that moment is, except weeping, I suppose. But anyway, the reader would not get that if he had told the story earlier. So the only possible solution is to tell the story afterward. So instead, here he tells it in chapter 9. He has Gimli relate it pretty much in full. It's it's a briefer version. Actually, if you go and read... Um I think it's the War of the Ring. I think it's there is a volume of of Christopher Tolkien's History of Middle Earth. I think it's the I think it's the volume entitled The War of the Ring, where um, we get a fragment, we get an incomplete version of a fuller form of this story, as it would theoretically have been written by Tolkien if he had, you know, finished that version of the story. But here we get Gimli's version. I'm not going to spend too much time kind of pouring over the detail of this because we actually know the shape of this story already. We we know roughly what has happened here. We're going to cut ahead though to. Uh, to Gimli telling, like, the most important part of the story. To every ship they came up, uh, they came that was drawn up, and then they passed over the water to those that were anchored, and all the mariners were filled with the madness of terror and leapt overboard, save the slaves chained to the oars. Reckless we rode among our fleeing foes, driving them like leaves until we came to the shore, and then to each of the great ships that remained. Aragorn sent one of the Dinadain, and they comforted the captives that were aboard, and bade them to put aside fear and be free. Ere that dark day ended, none of the enemy were left to resist us. All were drowned, or were flying south in the hope to find their own lands upon foot. Strange and wonderful, I thought it that the designs of Mordor should be overthrown by such wraiths of fear and darkness. With its own weapons was it worsted. Strange indeed, said Legolas. In that hour I looked on Aragorn and thought how great and terrible a lord he might have become in the strength of his will had he taken the ring to himself. Not for naught does Mordor fear him, but nobler is his spirit than the understanding of Sauron, for he is not of the children of, for is he not of the children of Luthien? Never shall that line fail, though the excuse me, though the years may lengthen beyond count. Beyond the eyes of the dwarves are such foretellings, said Gimli. But mighty indeed was Aragorn that day. Lo, all the black fleet was in his hands, and he chose the greatest ship to be his own, and he went up into it. Then he let sound a great concourse of trumpets taken from the enemy, and the shadow host withdrew to the shore. There they stood silent, hardly to be seen save for a red gleam in their eyes that caught the glare of the ships that were burning. And Aragorn spoke in a loud voice to the dead man, crying, Hear now the words of the heir of Isildur. Your oath is fulfilled. Go back and trouble not the valleys ever again. Depart and be at rest. 
This is the resolution to the oath-breaking dead. This is the resolution to the, the spirits and the ghosts that Aragorn summons up from the paths of the dead, uh, that, that he binds at the stone of Eric and that he leads south. They have fulfilled at this point their oath and they can at long last rest. What's most powerful here? Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to take one of the pins that I habitually keep here on the desk, and we're going to put it in a little detail here at the end of the first chapter because we're going to talk about this in the very next chapter, well, at the end of the first paragraph rather. We're going to talk about this in the next chapter next week when Aragorn again displays this kind of kingliness. Then to each of the great ships that remained, Aragorn sent one of the Dúnedain, and they comforted the captives that were aboard and bade them put aside fear and be free. Right? Put a pin in that. We'll circle back around to that as we're approaching uh, Moranon in next week's reading. Ere that dark day ended, none of the enemy were left to resist us. So we drove the entire, all of the Corsairs, we just drove them away from their ships. We killed them or they started fleeing south back toward Umbra. They just, they, they, they fled into the wilderness and that was it. Strange and wonderful, I thought it, that the designs of Mordor should be overthrown by such wraiths of fear and darkness with its own weapons was it worsted, says Gimli. Displaying a surprising lack of of experiential wisdom here in the frame of Middle Earth. As we've discussed before, this is what happens to evil in Middle Earth. This is the natural consequence of evil in Middle Earth. This innate self-destruction is inextricable from our understanding of evil and malice and fury and wrath that we associate with Sauron, that we associate with Saruman, that we associate with Morgoth back in the day, right? Evil is always, in a sense, its own undoing. But he's struck by this again. I thought that the designs of Mordor, uh, str uh, strange and wonderful, I thought that the designs of Mordor should be overthrown by such rates of fear and darkness. And Legolas is like, yeah, yeah. Actually, I was thinking about what if Aragorn had taken the ring? That would have been real bad. That would have been real bad, you guys. Not for naught does Mordor fear him, but nobler is his spirit than the understanding of Sauron. Nobler is his spirit than the understanding of Sauron here. Mordor is terrified of Aragorn, right? That's why Aragorn is here. That's why Aragorn uncloaked himself using the Palantir and revealed himself to Sauron, showing him the blade that was reforged. He revealed himself to Sauron because Sauron is bloody terrified of what would happen if Aragorn got the ring. Sauron would absolutely be cast down if Aragorn had and used the ring. There's no question about it. Uh, Sauron would be would be blasted apart, and and whatever happens to the ultimate fate of uh, immortal spirits in the in the realm of uh, Arda, we don't know and can't speculate. But certainly, Aragorn would destroy him. Aragorn would then become a new Dark Lord. But cold comfort would that be to Sauron? Right? He would still lose. Aragorn would 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 tear him apart. Which is why Sauron launches the preemptive strike against Minas Tirith. It is why. Sauron's going to construct a, not elaborate trap, but a trap of sorts as we approach the Black Gate in next week's reading. Sauron is terrified of Aragorn, particularly the possibility, as Sauron believes is true, that Aragorn has the ring. But nobler is his spirit than the understanding of Sauron. Actually, Legolas is saying, no, Sauron shouldn't be afraid of Aragorn, because if Sauron actually knew Aragorn, if Sauron actually understood Aragorn, then he wouldn't be afraid, because he would know that Aragorn would never take up the ring. For is he not of the children of Luthien? Never shall that line fail, though the years may lengthen beyond count. Right? It doesn't matter. Like, Aragorn has resisted the ring. Aragorn was always going to resist the ring. Aragorn is of the line of Luthien. He's never going to fall. He's never going to falter. If Sauron really understood that, huh, doesn't that create an interesting parallel? Because who else has witnessed things from a great distance. Who else has witnessed things imperfectly through the Palantir? Well, you know what? We're going to talk about it in literally the next slide, so we'll, we'll get to that. But yes, there is a connection here between Sauron and Denethor, right? Both prideful, both... There was some discussion after the fact last time uh, about Denethor's great sins being pride and despair. And why is pride such a great sin? Like, like pride is obviously a sin, but why is pride counted as one of Denethor's chief sins? Despair is the problem. Despair is what causes him to try to kill Faramir and ultimately kill himself and, and causes him to betray his duty as steward, right? Despair is the problem. But the pride is a necessary component of the despair. Because in order to believe that you know the outcome beyond all doubt, in order to actually be completely bereft of hope, you have to believe that your ability to discern the future, that your ability to understand the world is perfect. And that is prideful. That is arrogant. So Aragorn doesn't fall into that category, but Sauron apparently does. Sauron believes that his, his, 
his wisdom is so perfect and infallible that of course Aragorn has the ring. If Sauron were not possessed of that same pride that brings Denethor down, then the book wouldn't unfold in the way that it does. And in that way too, evil sows the seeds of its own destruction, right? Sauron's titanic power leads to this titanic pride, leads to this titanic arrogance, which leads to his ultimate downfall. More on that as we get there. Um, okay, let's I'm just checking the time and checking my uh, checking my uh, <laughs> slides that I have left. You know what? Let's get into the debate here. I think that's the best thing to do. Yeah, uh, Man of the West saying, uh, just like he can't comprehend, someone would destroy the ring. Sauron is blinded to the fact that Aragorn would never take up the ring. Yes, this is why the plan... Uh, okay, spoilers for the end of the book, you guys. This is why the plan succeeds. This is why sending Frodo and Sam into Mordor actually works. It's because Sauron cannot conceive that anyone would not claim the ring immediately, would not rise to challenge him when they inevitably claim the ring, would not seek to preserve the ring as he apparently imbued the ring with, you know, he imbued the ring with a desire or a power to enact its own self-preservation, I suppose. That's one way of reading it anyway. Sauron cannot conceive of these things, which is why they work. Let's get into the actual, uh, into the actual last debate. Though, I gotta tell you, not much of a debate. It's more of Gandalf laying things out. But speaking of Denethor, my lords, said Gandalf, Listen to the words of the steward of Gondor before he died. You may triumph on the fields of the Pelennor for a day, but against the power that has now arisen there is no victory. I do not bid you despair as he, as he did, but to ponder the truth in these words. The stones of seeing do not lie, and not even the lord of Barad-dûr can make them do so. He can, maybe, by his will, choose what things shall be seen by weaker minds, or cause them to mistake the meaning of what they see. Nonetheless, it cannot be doubted that what, when Denethor saw great forces arrayed against him in Mordor, and more still being gathered, he saw that which truly is. Hardly has our strength sufficed to beat off the first great assault, the next will be greater. This war, then, is without final hope, as Denethor perceived. Victory cannot be achieved by arms, whether you sit here to endure siege after siege, or march out to be overwhelmed beyond the river. You have only a choice of evils, and prudence would counsel you to strengthen such strong places as you have, and there await the onset. For so shall the time before your end be made a little longer. Then you would have us retreat to Minas Tirith, or Dol Amroth, or to Dunharrow, and there sit like children on sandcastles when the tide is flowing, said Emrahil. That would be no new counsel, said Gandalf. Have you not done this a little more in all the days of Denethor? But no, I said this would be prudent. I do not counsel prudence. I said victory could not be achieved by arms. I still hope for victory, but not by arms. For into the midst of all these policies comes the ring of power, the foundation of Barad-dûr, and the hope of Sauron. Concerning this thing, my lords, you now all know enough for the understanding of our plight and of Sauron's. If he regains it, your, va your valor is vain, and his victory will be swift and complete, so complete that none can foresee the end of it while this world lasts. If it is destroyed, then he will fall, and his fall will be so low that none can foresee his arising ever again, for he will lose the best part of the strength that was native to him in the beginning, and all that was made or begun with that power will crumble, and he will be maimed forever." becoming a mere spirit of malice that gnaws itself in the shadows and cannot again grow or take shape. And so a great evil of the world will be removed. Other evils there are that may come, for Sauron himself is but a servant or emissary. Yet it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule." Gandalf demonstrating here a greater wisdom, of course, because every time that it has seemed as though we have caught, uh, caught and cast out evil, the end of the first age, the end of the second age, and potentially now, if things work out with a couple of hobbits currently in Mordor, every time that we've thought that we've cast out evil forever, spoilers, evils come back, you guys. Like, evil always comes back. Evil always returns, and it doesn't always return in the same shape. Morgoth is cast out into the great dark. Like, Morgoth is cast out of Arda, but there's still a Sauron, and even if we find some way of destroying Sauron forever, there's still going to be a Sauron 2 electric boogaloo. We're still going to have Sauron the return, right? Something We're going to have the Kylo Ren to his Darth Vader is going to show up inevitably, but actually, that's not our problem. Like, we can't do anything about that. All we can do is take care of the fields that we are offered. You know, all we can do is decide what to do with the time that is given to us, right? To cast all the way back to the beginning of the book. All we can do is tend these fields and give the next generation clean earth. They're going to have to deal with the weather and the weeds that they face themselves. 
So you'll see Gandalf quoting Denethor here, right? Denethor was not wrong. That's the important part about Gandalf's quote. You may triumph on the fields of the Pelennor for a day, but against the power that has now arisen, there is no victory. There is no chance of fighting off the host of Mordor at this point. Um, and we get to a little acknowledgement here of what actually happened to Denethor. The, the stones of seeing do not lie, not even the Lord of Barador can make them do so. He can maybe by his will choose what things shall be seen by weaker minds or cause them to mistake the meaning of what they see. He can selectively show you what is happening in the world. He selectively showed Denethor what was happening in the world and sometimes presumably twisted Denethor's interpretation so that he was was misled by those visions. Oh, there was a, a fleet of black ships sailing up the Anduin toward Gondor. And yeah, okay, there is. I mean, that's factually correct, but your interpretation of those events is at least incomplete and probably closer to being absolutely wrong. Hardly is our strength suffice to beat off the first great assault. The next will be greater. This war then is without final hope as Denethor, as Denethor perceived. Victory cannot be achieved by arms. You have only a choice of evils and prudence would counsel you to strengthen such strong places as you have. To which Imrahil replies, like completely logically, then you would have us retreat to Minas Tirith or Dol Amroth or to Dunharrow and there sit like children on sandcastles when the tide is flowing? Like, Imrahil, by the way, clearly not supporting this argument. Imrahil not suggesting that we withdraw from Minas Tirith or even that we preserve and, and that, we, that we batten down the hatches and prepare for another greater siege here at Minas Tirith or that we withdraw. Like, children on sandcastles when the tide is flowing, says Imrahil. That sounds like a really sucky idea, Gandalf, actually. I'm not really up for that. That would be no new counsel, said Gandalf. Have you not done this and little more in all the days of Denethor? But no, I said this would be prudent. I do not counsel prudence. We're not going to win the war. The war is not what matters. If all of this, if the entire Third Age, if the War of the Ring comes down to actual warfare, if it comes down to an actual contest of arms, then it doesn't matter whether we fight here, there, today, tomorrow, doesn't matter. We are going to lose. That is it. There is no hope of a martial victory in the War of the Ring. Our only hope is presumably somewhere out there in Mordor climbing up a cliff face or arguing with Gollum or something. We don't know, but we still have hope. Sauron clearly doesn't have the ring. If Sauron had the ring, this would be a moot point right now. Like, like it doesn't matter. There is no force on earth. There is no wind from the sea that could have raised the clouds above the darkest, uh, the dawnless day. Yeah, if Sauron had the ring, this would already be over. He clearly doesn't. Therefore, there is still hope. And that hope, well, let's move on to the next slide. He is watching. He sees much and hears much. His Nazgul are still abroad. They passed over the field ere the sunrise, though few of the weary and sleeping were aware of them. He studies the signs, the sword that robbed him of his treasure remade, the winds of fortune turning in our favor, and the defeat unlooked for of his first assault, the fall of his great captain. His doubt will be growing even as we speak here. His eye is now straining towards us, blind almost to all else that is moving, and so we must keep it. Therein lies all our hope. This then is my counsel. We have not the ring. In wisdom, O oh great folly, it has been sent away to be destroyed, lest it destroy us. Without it, we cannot by force defeat his force. But we must at all costs keep his eye from his true peril. We cannot achieve victory by arms, but by arms we can give the ring-bearer his only chance, frail though it be. As Aragorn has begun, so we must go on. We must push Sauron to his last throw. We must call out his hidden strength so that he shall empty his land. We must march out to meet him at once. We must make ourselves the bait, though his jaws should close on us. He will take that bait in hope and in greed, for he will think that in such rashness he sees the pride of the new ring lord. And he will say, so, he pushes out his neck too soon and too far, let him come on and behold, I will have him in a trap from which he cannot escape. There I will crush him, and what he has taken in his insolence shall be mine again forever. We must walk open-eyed into that trap, with courage and small hope for ourselves, for my lords... It may well prove that we ourselves shall perish utterly in a black battle far from the living lands, so that even if Barador be thrown down, we shall not live to see a new age. But this, I deem, is our duty, and better so than to perish nonetheless, as we surely shall if we sit here, and know as we die that no new age shall be. He is watching, he sees much, and hears much, his Nazgul are still abroad. He studies the signs, the sword that robbed him of the treasure remade. Okay, Anduril... Flame of the West has been reforged. Narsil has been reforged into Anduril. The winds of fortune turning in our favor and the defeat unlooked for of his first assault, the fall of his great captain. Four things Sauron is definitely paying attention to right now. The reforging of the blade, the turning of the winds, the defeat of the first assault, and the fall of the Witch King of Angmar. 
All of these could be attributed to this new ring lord. All of this could be attributed to Aragorn bearing the ring of power. If he's got the one ring, then actually the wind from the south isn't a miracle. It isn't you catastrophe. It isn't the intervention of Manwe. It is the power of the new lord of the ring. That's what he's seeing. That's what's manifesting itself right now. So all of this fits in Sauron's conception of what is happening here. And the only hope that they have is to continue what Aragorn has already begun. Be the Corsairs, be the fleet of black ships coming up the, the Anduin. Attract the attention of Sauron and hold his eye. Walk into the trap, even knowing that it is a trap, because if we can keep him focused on us, then the ring bearer far to the east has a chance. That, I think, is going to do it for tonight. We're, okay, let's talk just a little. I can't resist talking about this last paragraph, even though I'm already after time. We must walk open out into that trap with courage and small hope for ourselves. For my lords, he says, formalizing this language, right? For my lords, words of respect, titles of respect here. I appreciate that we have duties. I appreciate that we have responsibilities. I appreciate that we are leaders of man, stewards of man. For, my lords, it may well prove that we ourselves shall perish utterly in a black battle far from the living lands, so that even if Barador be thrown down, we shall not live to see a new age. But this, I deem, is our duty. And better so than to perish nonetheless, as we surely shall if we sit here and know that uh, know as we die, no new age shall be. Okay, if we blow this, we can sit here and wait for Sauron to come, and know without doubt as we die that the world is falling into darkness. Or we can march to him and believe that there is some small fragment of hope, even if we ourselves perish, even if we fall on the field of battle, Barador may still thereafter be thrown down and there shall perhaps be a new age. There shall perhaps still be some hope. It's not hope for us. And look at how this mimics, how this echoes everything that Frodo has said to Sam, right? I've never had any hope of coming home. Like, there's a tiny hope that we might succeed and throw the ring into the crack of the... Like, okay, there's a tiny hope that we might destroy the ring. There is no hope at all that we are going to leave Mordor and go back to the Shire. We've already given that up long before we've approached, you know, Kiddith Ungol. We, we've already, yeah, we, we've dispensed with that particular hope. No, there's a slim hope that we're going to succeed and then we're granting the world a new chance. We're, we're granting the world a new dawn after that. We're granting the world a new age. And Gandalf here in exactly the same place. Is there a hope that we will ride home after this battle? Well, no, pretty much not. No, we have to walk into this trap. We have to walk into Sauron's jaws, open-eyed, clear-hearted. Like, we've got to do this thing, but we're not going to come back. But it doesn't matter because in the doing of the thing, we preserve the hope for others. We'll talk more about the transferal of hope to other people as we uh, move through the rest of the reading. We did pretty well, you guys. We got through a lot of slides. So we're going to conclude the very end of uh, Chapter 9 next week, and then we'll get into Chapter 10, The Black Gate Opens, and we'll talk a little about the timeline. We'll talk a little about what is happening in other parts of Middle-earth, and then we are going to get to the knockout last stand of Peregrine, Son of Paladin. The end of chapter 10 is just fantastic. That is, of course, the end of book five. Then the following week, we will get into book six and pick up with Frodo and Sam at Kirith Ungol. That is going to do it. Let me see here. Um, cancel the slide. Okay. Two minutes. Let's cancel the slide and take a look in the question bucket. Uh, Angela saying, Gandalf to Denethor, it's not about you. Leadership is understanding slash accepting surrender slash sacrifice and hope. And Aragorn, Theoden, and Eomer embodies it Excuse me, book five is Lord of the Rings, Dark Knight of the Soul. More observation than question, says Angela. Yes. I mean, yes. Leadership is understanding and accepting surrender and sacrifice and hope. Yes, though not just that. There is one other element, I suppose, that I would I would throw into your into your crucible there, your 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 crucible of kingship, Angela, and that is this repeated beat that kings lead from the front. That kings lead, in fact, right? Kings do not puppeteer their kingdoms. That is not what good ruling figures do in Middle Earth. Contrast Theoden, after the influence of Wormtongue has been has been cleansed from him, with Eomer and with Aragorn, right? Faramir, even even Boromir, right? Let's give Boromir his his due credit in this regard. Kings lead from the front. That is what good kings do. Contrast those with the bad kings. Look at Denethor. Look at Sauron. Look at Saruman, right? Even Saruman is hiding away, still hiding away, for all we know, in his tower at Orthanc. He's still behind the lines. He's not leading, and that is the thing that good kings do. But yes, surrender and sacrifice and hope, 
yeah, that is actually pretty much the role of kings with some other minor details like, you know, being able to heal scrofula too. Yes, good. Um, oh, interesting. Austin asking, when Aragorn wakes Eowyn, a wind blows, could that be a wind from Valinor? More winds of fate? Um, it certainly is possible, Austin, right? That is that is a good, astute bit of, of close reading there. That is a good, astute bit of critical analysis. Yes. I am less inclined to attribute the wind to Valinor explicitly and exclusively, I suppose, than I am to kind of see this as a manifestation of something that is more complicated, I suppose. Is the wind off the sea? Is the wind from the west? Yes, but it is also that clean, sweet smell of air that has yet been unbreathed. I would credit that to the to the Athalas, honestly. We see that that creates a scent in the room that is healing and recuperative and seems distinct to each individual, right? It is different for Mary than it is for Eowyn. It is different for Eowyn than it was for Faramir. That seems to be pretty, pretty powerful there. And also, of course, the presence of Aragorn too. So is it, ha ha, okay, here's the distinction that I would draw. Is it from Valinor? Yes, metaphorically and incompletely perhaps, but, but yes. Is it of Valinor? That is to say that is the wind that cleanses the, the dark shadow from Eowyn's soul the same as the wind that blows up off of the ocean and carries the Black Fleet north and, and, and shreds the, the clouds of the Dawnless Day? No, I don't think that those are the same thing. I don't think that that is the same kind of, of provenance associated with that thing. This seems to me to be more healing and restorative and recuperative. But yeah, I mean, that that is a... That is an intuitive response for me. That is an emotional response for me more than it is a close reading response. I think that reading the text, I think reading this as as a wind of Valinor, which we are, of course, primed to, to look for at this point in the tradition of the wind blowing from the sea and blowing the Black Fleet north and, of course, the, the divine wind that is spoken of in the Dwarf Song all the way back in The Hobbit, right? Yeah, we've done this before. We kind of expect this kind of thing. So that mingled with the Athalas, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, you might even... Huh, okay, if you were inclined to, you might even see this as another wind-based piece of eucatastrophe, right? That the blowing of the wind is eucatastrophic. That is the intercession of, of grace and possibility. Nothing is going to heal Eowyn. Oh, but the wind. And then the wind is the opportunity. The eucatastrophe is, as ever, the opportunity that empowers Aragorn to take action, which is the actual act of healing, right? His final words there as he, as he rouses Eowyn from her slumber. Maybe, maybe. I would read it more as Aragorn's healing, but I think there's, there is space to, uh, to look at that. Yeah. Jackie's saying here, uh, it reminds me of the wind over the plains of Rohan. <laughs> and Shane's saying, I think my Athalas would be baking cookies or pizza. Yeah, no, that's, that's, <laughs> what is your personal Athalas? I kind of like that idea that, uh, you know, everyone was walking around a couple of years ago with, with X is my Patronus on, on t-shirts and, uh, Twitter bios and stuff like that. Yeah. Now uh, let's start a new campaign. Uh, hashtag is my Athalas. Like, I, yeah. What, what scent, uh, communicates to you, uh, restoration and recuperation. That's, that's, I, I mean, clearly for me, it is that first pot of coffee in the morning. It is in particular that first pot of coffee in the morning where you wake five minutes before your alarm and discover that someone has already made coffee. Like, ah, oh, that's it. That's the scent. Imbued with that scent, I would be roused from, from the black shadow. Absolutely. I would be ready to march on the black gate by myself in that moment. That is hashtag is my Athelos. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. Um, good. Oh, C Star saying uh, basil pesto, sweet fern beeswax. That's very good. Our Faramir saying coffee. Yes. Uh, let me see here as I come back. Oh, very good. Cond. Classy as ever. The Athelos scent distillery and the smell of falling rain. Very good. Very good. Yes. And of course, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you might be, uh, you might be, oh, coffee and bacon are Faramir. The, the thought was incomplete. Man of the West saying campfire and scotch. This is all very good. Uh, Jackie saying Humboldt. It's fennel and ocean air and redwoods and mist and sunshine. Jackie, do you write copy for like the back of wine bottles or, you know, perfume? That's, that's, mm, that's very good indeed. Excellent work. All right. We're going to rest on that uh, wonderful and inspiring note. Guys, thank you all so much for your questions. If you have other questions, get in touch with me directly. You can email pointnorthmedia at gmail.com. So next week, we are in our usual slot, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, uh, next Thursday night, which is, let me double check the date here. That is going to be the 24th of May, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central on the 24th of May. We will finish up the last slide of Chapter 9 and move into Chapter 10. We will talk about the Mouth of Sauron. We will talk about where all the elves and dwarves are and what is going on there, and we will definitely talk 
talk about the timeline because having a handle on the timeline as we move into the end of book five is absolutely necessary particularly giving some artifact, uh, given some artifacts that are uh, going to play a significant part in the unfolding of Chapter 10. More on that when we get to it next time. Guys, this has been an absolute pleasure. Oh, JY saying I only just saw the Funko Pops in the background. Yeah, I've got me a, uh, I got me a Luna Lovegood and I've got me a, uh, a Giles up there. Also, you can just see very quietly here as I point on the video version of this podcast a, uh, a little Garnet and a little Peridot from Steven Universe. Little, uh, little Lego figures of them. I will move my hand so that you can see them. Anyway, that is going to do it for this week's session of There and Back Again. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. This has been an absolute blast. I will talk to you all again very soon. Until then, fly, you fools! Fly, you fools!